Hey, what's up? I'm Eddie Malouf. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be going over sales training with my team. So this is a behind the scenes look. If you don't know me, I run an agency with about 130 team members right now. And behind the scenes, I do a lot of trainings with my team, whether it's on marketing, whether it's on sales. And in this video, I'm going to go over a sales training that I did behind the scenes where they brought their questions to me. They brought their biggest objections that they were having. And I go and answer them all specifically the way that I do so that they understand how my brain works and why my closing rate is so high because of the specific frameworks that I put in place. This isn't a uh, speech that's set up for you. This isn't a training that's set up for you, uh, but this is going to give you way more value than everything like that because these are actual active salespeople that are selling every day, bringing their questions to me. And just so you know, the first portion of this video is going to be my story in sales, how I've done in sales, what I've done to do the things that I've done in sales and the achievements that I've done. And it's very, very valuable, has its own lessons. But if you've already heard my background, my story on the sales side, you can go ahead and skip it. You can jump into the second part of the video, which is going to be the Q&A section with me and my sales team, teaching them step-by-step -step how I do the things that I do and why I get such high closing rates. So that being said, take some notes. And I promise you by the end of this video, uh, there is no reason why your sales closing rate is not improving by 20 to 30% just from the information that's in this video. So take some notes and go out there and get some more deals. First off, how long have you been in sales? Like t take me back to when you first started, when, what, how old were you? What are we doing here? Uh, an interview, bro? Or are we trying to Podcast teach you guys style. how to close? Podcast <laughs> style. No, I, this is leading somewhere. This is leading somewhere. I mean, dude, I've been doing sales since I was like 12. 12 okay <laughs> no exaggeration i'm serious all right well 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 all right Give this us is the high ticket flooring bro i used to no, sell ten thousand fifteen thousand dollar jobs at 14. okay yeah i didn't know that well take yeah, i got fired by my own dad fucker because uh, i outsold his entire adult sales team and they complained that they had to pay their bills and i didn't so he fired me <laughs> jesus valid douche douche <laughs> I still give him shit for it. I'm like, dude, you would have had a much better flooring company if you just kept me. I mean, come on now. And then you come back and do and you know blast his company off with your marketing side, like you should have kept me. Anyways, yeah. all right. Well, <laughs> well, well, run us through, like, because I, you know, for some of these guys that haven't watched the podcast, that haven't seen, like, you've got a couple really cool points that that are uh, that I want you to bring up. One is your uh, experience at Lifetime Fit Fitness, the records that you broke specifically at the beginning and how you did that. So like what it actually takes to to hit those sort of things. And then ultimately, uh, oh, I want to also want to hear a, a, a short version, perhaps of the Burger King story, because that's a really cool one. And then uh, af after that, you can fill in any of the dots and then we'll let the guys we'll let the guys ask you your questions. Oh, yeah. So um, I guess I'll give you some sales points. Um, one, uh, the 14 year old thing I told you. So basically I, uh, worked with my dad at 14 only on Saturdays. Uh, he had a flooring company, uh, and he had four salespeople that were in the flooring business for 20 years. I came in and, um, basically what I did was, uh, I was like, Hey, I don't want to sell anything this Saturday. Uh, I'll sell something next Saturday. Uh, and basically what I did all day was I went through, we had like four or 5 million square feet worth of flooring. But most of the stuff in the showroom was like samples, right? So you could like look through tiles and look through flooring pieces. And so what I did was I basically spent all day understanding flooring. Like, you know, what is what what's a nylon carpet versus a polyester carpet? You know what I mean? What's a ceramic uh, tile versus a porcelain tile? Where should each one go? Uh, should it go outside? Should it go in, in a water environment inside? Like, what, what are the benefits of each uh, engineered wood versus solid wood? try to understand everything, uh, which I think is probably the most important part of sales. Um, so I understood everything. Uh, after that day, I just spent like 12 hours learning. Next Saturday, I came in <clears throat> and I sold uh, $85,000 worth of revenue. The entire four salespeople combined sold $15,000 worth of revenue. <laughs> I was a 14 year old. Flex. Uh, and they're like, what the fuck is going on? So I kept doing that pretty much every week after three weeks. Uh, they went to my dad and they said, hey, your son's taking all our jobs. Those deals would have been ours if he if he wasn't here, which in reality, as you guys know, they probably wouldn't have closed these deals, which is why I was selling so much. Uh, so in order to not lose his full-time guys that work six days a week, he fired a son that works one day a week and closes more than all of them. Uh, so that was my first experience in like actual sales, uh, getting paid commission. <clears throat> then in college, I did network marketing. Have you, has, haven't you guys done network marketing? Joe? Nice. Yo, nice. You guys know what network marketing sell, is? Yeah, I used to sell expensive pots and pans using network marketing mixed with level, multi level marketing. Nice. Sell Does anyone know what multi level marketing is out of the rest of you guys? 
it, it sounds like what well, well, people would say, you know, MLM, yeah. right? Like, I mean, yeah. a pyramid yep. is to what, yeah. That's exactly what we did. So basically, uh, I had to go and like recruit random ass people in college uh, to come show up to a meeting that I couldn't tell them what it was about uh, and uh, get them to show up to some random person's house on a weekday night and then pitch them something and then get them to pay 600 bucks as a college student. So that was a cool experience because it challenged me to not give a fuck and just talk to people like I don't care about you can't care about rejection if that's the if that's where you're what you're trying to do and you also have to be really clever right so it really taught me how to uh invoke curiosity and not give all the answers and still get someone to be curious enough to show up uh because i can't tell them what it is but i need them at 8 p.m to drive to this random person's house 20 minutes away and show up alone uh so it's not that easy it sounds like you're gonna kill them um can't tell you <laughs> what it is but it's an awesome opportunity i promise you uh hi nice toothpaste company so you get it uh so that was cool because uh not only did it challenge my rejection uh but it challenged my ability to pitch uh with a sense of curiosity and also storytelling so i would i was the main closer for the state of georgia uh we had like a few thousand people in the state of georgia but basically everyone bringing them to the event and then i would stand up and basically pitch it and then everyone would basically sell their own person after i pitched um so it really taught me how to pitch with stories. So like I never went up there and just started talking about what it is that we do. I started talking about the problems that we're solving. So for example, uh, one, I needed to help people understand the concept of it. So instead of telling them, um, you know, here's what we do and here's how we make money. I, I said, you know, different companies advertise different ways. Some people use billboards. Some people spend money on influencers. And so trying to explain how marketing works uh, and then later on, they would understand that we are now the marketing tool for the cup. We're the billboards. They pay us to go tell other people and then we get the money, right? So I was trying to dumb down the concepts by sharing stories that were relative, which made it very easy to communicate at a mass scale to people. So I think that was a very big skill I learned in sales. Uh, and instead of selling, I, I story tell. I give examples of other people rather than saying chris you know chris is uh struggling with uh his deadlift pr and he's not having he's having trouble getting over 250 then instead of telling chris hey dude here's what i would do to get over 250 i go dude i knew a guy same situation you were his name is ty he was having the same exact problem what he ended up doing was flipping his grip and just because ty flipped his grip he added like extra 50 pounds to his deadlift now chris takes that as a story of like Oh, that's super relative to me, but it's not directed towards me. So it, it kind of removes the defensive block that people have when you give them advice. Like if I walked up to someone in the gym, I was like, dude, you're doing your triceps wrong. You should, <clears throat> you should, instead of doing them this way, do them this way. People will be like, whatever, dude, I already like in their head and they'll be like, oh, cool. Thanks. But in their head, they'll be like, whatever. But if I went up to them, I was like, dude, I know a guy who used to do that same thing. Probably the biggest triceps I've ever seen on a guy. I asked him why and what he did differently was this. And I don't know, just something I figured I'd tell you. I guarantee that he will take that and go do it more than me giving him the advice directly. So I learned that in network marketing, which is a <clears throat> huge, huge, huge thing in sales for me. Uh, that's been super helpful. And then my third stint as a, as a sales job uh, was uh, working at Lifetime Fitness. I did it kind of to just transparently. I, it wasn't a job that I like wanted but uh basically what happened was i was starting a company in lebanon for supplements to sell them e-commerce online uh in the time of me doing that i needed to make money but i needed to have a career where um i basically wouldn't screw over the employer if i left um because i knew i was gonna leave because i was i was starting this company so instead of going to a career where they like really needed me and they if i left uh, that it would really hurt them and they would invest a lot of time into me i figured if i went into sales it's like an in and out job like if i give them a month notice they'll find another salesperson i'm not gonna you know hurt the company in a negative way that was very important to me no matter what company i worked for um which uh was awesome so i took that job uh their sales training process is intensive not that they taught me sales uh, but they taught me a lot about the company the culture the core values the mission statement i had to have all those things memorized before i start uh, they put us in a one-week training program. They flew us to Minnesota to their HQ. It was a one-week training program on the company, the sales process, et cetera. Um, and they had little things like Wednesday, we show up at 5.30 in the morning to a 
uh, a group fitness class so we can understand that. And if you're one minute late, you're disqualified and you're fired. So that morning, three people didn't make it on time and they basically flew them home on the next flight. Uh, so it was a pretty intensive process. I wasn't as light as people think. Uh, that being said, I got back February. Uh, it was There was 28 days in February. I got back February 25th. Uh, the team was behind on quota. We basically needed like 15 more units. Uh, and we were based on the normal pace. They were probably going to put up 10, 11 units. Uh, so I believe that I was the best closer on the team. Um, but they wouldn't give me any opportunities till my actual start day, which was March 1st. So no walk-ins, no calls, no appointments, nothing that people would get from the marketing I could get. Uh, so basically what I did was I locked myself in a back office for three days. I went through the expired customer list, meaning no one has talked to them in more than 30 days. And I just started dialing. Uh, in those three days, I dialed 900 people. Uh, I came out with five sales. I closed the most sales in that four day period out of the entire team. All of them had a book of business. All of them had lead flow from the company. All of them had way more resources than I had. Uh, I closed all of them. We hit quota by one over because of the extra sales that I added that they didn't account for. Um, and from there, I basically set the tone. So uh, I never had a single day uh, without less than fe uh, 50 follow-up tasks on my calendar. Some days I had 150, 200 follow-up tasks. Uh, and I would just go down the list. I would start tasks and just start calling and texting all these people. Uh, eventually, I started realizing texting was a lot better than calling. Uh, so I basically had a Google Voice number on my computer. And I would have two screens. And I would take their info, put it in Google Voice, and just start chatting. So I would have hundreds of text chats going at the same time with my clients. Um, and so I built a book of business faster than anyone else in that company. Uh, and you would be surprised by month two, pretty much everyone that was walking in the door was asking for Eddie and everyone's like, what the fuck is going on? What is this kid doing? Like, how come everyone just asked for Eddie? Like they're not even walk-ins anymore. They're just coming to ask. Oh, I'm here to meet with Eddie. I'm here to meet with Eddie. I'm here to meet with Eddie. So, um, it was just purely outreach to old leads that were there. And I basically made them fully know who I am because I realized not these, these guys aren't going to pick up calls, but they'll text me back and forth all day. Um, then I created my own system, <clears throat> which lifetime still uses to this day. Um, I basically had a piece of paper like this. This is uh, super important. I had a piece of paper. Let's call this a piece of paper. Uh, and on this piece of paper, I had VIP passes written on top and like name, email, phone number, name, email, phone number, name, email, phone number. Uh, and I basically said, listen, dude, if your friends come with you, the most they're going to get is a day pass. Uh, but I have three slots right here for any of your friends that you want to bring them in on a two week pass. So think about the friends that you would want to be in the gym the most with you and put their information down. Once I close this out, once you're signed up, I can't do this anymore. They'll forever only have one day pass and they can't come in for every 30 days. But if you put their info here, I'll reach out to them, I'll send them a text and I'll have a two week pass sitting here waiting for them. Now, I'll tell you this, if you want to put more than three, I can't put them on your profile, but I have some other people that didn't put three, scarcity. And if you put more on the back, I'll try to fit them on someone else's sheet. Every single person will give me eight to 10 names, emails and phone numbers. And I turned my book of business into an 8x, 10x, just by them wanting some sort of extra benefit, uh, not for themselves, but for their friends by putting their names on the list. Um, and so I immediately had a bigger book of business than the other seven salespeople combined. Uh, and in the month of June, I started to remember my first month was March. March, April, May, June, fourth month. Uh, I uh, hit the record in the company. By six days into the month, I hit the monthly quota. Uh, by 12 days into the month, I broke the company record for most sales at that location ever. Uh, and then I kind of took my foot off the gas because I needed to save contracts for the next month uh, just because the team was expecting a slow month. Sandbagger. Uh, yeah, I sandbagged. I sandbagged 28 deals, uh, which was a lot. Like that was like someone's quota. <laughs> Uh, so I put them on paper, I put them in my drawer, and then I enter them into the computer the next week. Uh, but I lost the award at the end of the month because someone in Canada ended up selling one more unit than me. But it's because I had 28 sandbagged in the in the drawer. But I did what was best for the team, uh, not my ego, and I got second place. But uh, that is my sales background uh, prior to Form Media. So I don't know if any lessons came out of that, but that's my story. Oh, yeah, I'm taking notes. These are individual trainings that you're dropping for us. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Amanda. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Ty. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Eddie. Um, I just had a question, and I want to preface this before I ask this question by saying 
you know, I, I completely understand selling with integrity and everything, but is it okay to make up stories when you don't have any that would illustrate a point? Because I usually, I usually sell with stories as well, but sometimes for a specific or a specific point that I'm trying to make, I don't necessarily have a particular story that I know of that would illustrate that point. And so is it okay to make one up? <clears throat> Who's the greatest storyteller of all time? Jesus. Great. And what did Jesus do? <clears throat> write a book. No, I mean, he didn't write a book. Didn't say he made it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm going to say. I'm going to say he told that's parables. Right. Parables, that's right. Yeah. And Jesus told parables. So he told stories that weren't necessarily true, but they had the lesson inside of them. So um, I'm not saying go and say, yeah, me and my wife did this and it's totally bullshit. But uh, have you heard the, have you heard the example, you know, have you heard the story of the, the tortoise and the turtoise and the hare? Yes, I have. No, I haven't. Great. Well, this, that's a lesson. That's a story. You get what I'm saying? So what I would do is I would, if anything, I would spend a day trying to find the stories and the parables that are told a certain way or someone quoted a certain way or et cetera, and create a document with a few pages worth of those things that each one overcomes a certain objection and have like four or five of them per objection type and use those to leverage that in storytelling because it still gets the same lesson across all sometimes yeah. my best stories are not real ones but they're ones that i'm telling about a parable or a, a lesson yeah. that some other person used to teach and bring it and it, it opens their eyes and makes it very easy there's a reason those things are popular it's because they're very easy for people to understand yeah no 100 percent. i mean human beings have been telling stories for centuries you know so it's like ingrained in our dna to be able to resonate with it so yeah, Awful. great great question though. Yep. Who, who else? <clears throat> All right. I mean, I'll go. By the way, Eddie, Chris is always jumping in first. He's always raising his hand. He's always asking for feedback first. I can and tell in the not, chats. <laughs> it's not surprised surprising to me that he's jumping in now. I just want to throw that out there. Cool. Um, anyways, so there there's three main points. Uh price, story. Okay, no, 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 hold on. Yeah, so how do I know this is gonna work is like a big objection objection that I get, right? Like I, I tell them the whole thing and they're like, yeah, man, this, this sounds great. It sounds like it's, it's what I need, but what if I don't make my money back? And I, and I go, you know, I, I try to go the honest route with them, right? Sure, like you might not, but like I'm trying to sound believable, but still like- How much are you charging, Chris? 1,500 bucks. Great. Um, who here gets paid 1,500 bucks or less? No Wait, one. I'm, I'm asking the crowd who here gets paid 1500 bucks or less anyone no negative. okay negative great perfect so I, I as a shop right can, can you give me uh, an example of an employee that you would go hire for 1500 bucks like what kind of employee would you be able to get for 1500 bucks like a tech a person who sits at the front desk person who sits at the front desk great yeah how much how, how much experience does this 1500 bucks a person make at the front like how much experience do they have are they are they running shops are they do they have operations that they've ran they don't they're they're probably just an hourly wage type person right 100 percent. okay so we agree that for 1500 bucks that's the most that you can get right yes so so but, but here's the thing i'll jump in here so it's it, it is it's three grand right so with, with ad spend now another thing is some of these guys they don't have any other employees it's just them yeah that's fine let's say it's 2500 bucks with ad spend because it's a thousand dollars what employee can they get for 2500 bucks there there is there is not one that they can get full time for 2500 bucks okay here's how i used to close all these shops okay because okay. I, had, I had the same objection i used to help them understand that the, that the risk is less risk than you hiring an employee okay if you're going to go hire an employee this employee has no experience in shops they don't have hundreds of shops that they're managing. They don't have systems and operations of their own. They don't have a proven track record of case studies. Their company isn't making a million dollars a month plus. They don't have all these things. And you're gonna pay them the same price that you'd be paying us to come in with that experience. So the same risk that you carry, if you hire an employee, you're gonna end up paying the employee and they could not work out in 60 days, is less risk that you carry paying us who have a proven track record, who have all the staff, who have all the systems in place, who have the case studies, you still are gonna carry a risk both ways. 
but your risk here is maybe 10% of the risk that it takes for you to go hire a team member and do it. And if we want to take the alternative of a cheaper option, your risk is even higher because the reason that person is cheap is because they do not have the experience. They do not have the case studies. They do not have the business size that we do. And therefore, they do not have the experience to get the results that you want. Therefore, you have way more risk even paying someone less than us or going and getting an employee. We are the least risky play if you are trying to grow your business and have an actual shot at cracking the marketing space. There's Sounds 300 awesome. shops that we've worked with. Find me someone else remotely close, even half our price that has the same track record we have. It's impossible. You know what I mean? And I used to say this to them when we had 20 clients, dude. Like, and now it's even, the gap is even bigger. No one has the, the record that we have. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I like to help them understand that if they took this money and spent it elsewhere in their business, that there's not a better opportunity to spend it. And once you understand that, it's not about telling them to spend it. It's showing them where else they could spend it and how it's not going to work. You know what I mean? Makes sense. Good question. You had two more though before Claudia goes. Okay. So I, I just, I just really have, hold on. No, I'll let Claudia go and I'll, I'll gather my thoughts together. Cool. Well, I just, my, my, my question's actually to kind of piggyback off Chris's and I'm just, I would just love to hear your way of thinking, Eddie. So that's say like, same objection. Okay, Chris is applying that to auto shops. How would you apply this to an info product? What's the objection? Like someone say, like someone investing into them wanting to build out, like say I'm working with Kelsey at the moment, someone wanting to build out a their own digital product or they're building out their own brand. And what if they're like, you know, what if this doesn't work? Like, how would you, where would your brain go when it goes to an informational product like that? Yeah, so um, I would give comparable answers first. Uh, so, so before the money objection, I would work on the it doesn't work objection. Because if I fix that one, then the money objection figures itself out, right? Yeah. So I would give relative examples that normal people can understand, like a personal mm -hmm. trainer. Mm -hmm. Okay. What if I what if yeah. I got a personal trainer that was in extremely great shape? Mm -hmm. And they have a ton of clients and they do the same thing for all their clients. They tell them exactly what to do. They show up and they work out with them. There's a few clients that are out of shape and the rest of the clients are in shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you blame the trainer or do you blame the clients that are out of shape? If everyone okay. else is in shape, do you understand what I'm saying? And so I'm just giving you one off the top of my head. Now, if I got to sit down and like come up with like four or five situations that were similar, I would just bank them and then have them ready to go when people ask me those things. But that's how I overcome all objections is, is a story yeah. like that. I, I compare something that that is very easy to understand for them that has the same exact outcome where it's on you, it's not on the person, yeah. the system works, and help them understand that and let them tell me, I think it's the person's fault. And then yeah. now, now they've cornered themselves. And now yeah. I can say, this is exactly the same situation. The system works for other students. The system worked for us. We built this thing. We did we did it while, you know, Kelsey's raising four kids at the same time. Other moms mm -hmm. are doing it just like you. The only yeah. answer is if you're going to show up. And if you don't feel like you're going to show up, if you don't feel like you're going to take this seriously for a few months and give it an actual fair shot and you think you're going to become distracted with something else and this is going to be important, then do not spend your money on it. You know what I mean? I, I, I tell them, like, do not spend your money on it because you will not succeed. It's the same as training. You could pay the best trainer, the best nutritionist, they can give you the best plans and the best workouts. But if you do not work out and you do not cook the plans that they tell you to cook, you will not receive the results that you want. Therefore, you've wasted all that money. So if that is going to be you, do not do this. I'm telling you right now. But if you're going to follow what we put in place, you will find success. It's a matter of how fast you find success, but that will happen. You know what I mean? And that's, that's where I take it. Uh, and now, now they, they, they can't say anything because I've given them a real life example that they know damn well is the same exact scenario that they're going into right now. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Does so, that help or was that about it? Totally. No, no. It's, yeah. I was just curious of where, like where your mind goes for things. Cause like for me, when it comes to like you in sales, I mean, look, I, I, I'm a very big believer that everyone has very individual selling styles, like depending on their personalities and things like that. So I'm just, I just enjoy hearing about like which direction you specifically take when certain things come up. 
Yeah, my overall philosophy, as you can probably tell so far, is tie it to a relatable story that they can understand uh, yeah. and gets me the same point. So I basically, I if they give me any outcome of a different answer than what I'm cornering them to give, then they sound stupid. So they have to give that answer. Sometimes they just laugh. They're like, yeah. fuck, like, you're right. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can't say anything. <laughs> uh, and f for one, for the reason of relatability and understandability, but for yeah. two, for, for ego. Uh, like, if you ever tell someone directly, different people react differently. It's like a volatile thing that you're doing. If I mm -hmm. point at the other thing across the street and say, look at that thing, what do you think he's doing? or what, how do you think he got there or et cetera, it makes it more collaborative. It's like, man, you're right. I see what you're talking about versus like, you're attacking me and telling me I'm not going to show up and be good. It's like, no, yeah. these people over here, why don't you think they did well? Oh, they didn't show up. Okay, perfect. That's the reason that you wouldn't do well either. You know what I mean? So it makes it a little bit easier for me to be aggressive with the yeah. things that I'm saying. Instead of being like, you suck. I'd be like, you see how he sucks? Yeah, don't be like him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it makes it a little bit easier to swallow and they appreciate it. They feel like they're like now kind of collaborating rather than like being sold. It's like same side of the table, which is very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe, let, Joe, Joe, let's get you in here. You're muted. So I have like two questions. Oh. One is um, when I'm talking to the prospects of the auto clients is I'll build up the value of the product. Let's say ceramic coating. I tell them how good it is. I ask some questions. I get them to understand why they need to do this and everything. And then finally, when they ask the price, I drop the price. And then what I try to do is get them to come in for a consultation to lock in that price. What I want to do is I want to be able to get them to, if it's possible, to like do a deposit right there on the phone call. So I'm wondering like if there's a couple of last steps that I need in order to lock it in and then send them over a payment link right there on the spot. For the auto shops, like yeah. you're selling for the shops, right? Yes. Um, yeah, so I mean, what would be the reason that I would put a deposit down, I guess? Um, to lock in the price. So with one of the auto shops, for example, they have a thing where if you book in the next five days, they get a $200 discount, right? So what I try to do is either one, get them to come in for a consultation, but I want to know if it's possible to lock them in on that spot right there and then. Yeah, what's the point of the consultation? um we we say that it's for it's for us to look at the paint which sometimes it is especially for all the cars but once they get into the shop that's when they're more likely to pull the trigger because they see the car there's the cars there they see the process and then everything clicks in their mind mm, okay and how much is a consultation it's free mm, okay that's what you should change so maybe the consultation should be paid but refundable when they show up if that makes sense so okay. so i'll give you an example hey it's it's 49 bucks mm -hmm. for the consultation we have equipment that we spend we have to book the time and not give it to someone else if they walk in there's a million reasons why but we'll refund you this 49 dollars when you show up for the consultation so now now they're paying something so they're they're making a commitment if they don't show they lose 50 bucks so they're more likely to show and number two when that when that 50 bucks you know when when they come in you say okay cool listen we can refund you the 50 bucks or you can take the paint correction job and mm -hmm. bucks will credit you $200. So the same offer you originally had, but oh. now we're making it feel like their 50 is worth 200 when they come in. Uh, and on that, in that spot, I feel like they would probably be much more likely to take that offer knowing that they paid 50 and got $150 free dollars back essentially. You know what I mean? So instead of getting the refund, it's a little bit easier for them to be like, you know what, fuck it. Let me just do this. I like, if I'm going to get a $200 credit, I see it in front of my eyes, the difference in the car. Let me just lock it in. You know what I mean? I think it, it it's easier to ask for the money and it's justifiable because it's refundable. Um, and even in the invoice that you send, you it says, you know, refundable, refundable deposit for, um, you know, consultation. Um, and then, you know, you put the terms in the invoice. If you show up, you get the refund back. Um and then I think that's probably a, a good starting point, number one, in my opinion, if you want to take that route. Uh, okay, but you just uh, need to make sure you're on the same page with their sales team. So when they come in, they understand how to position that as a credit instead of a refund. Okay, I like that. Rex, uh, let's talk about this with, uh, with Trent. My last question is, um, there's some people I book uh, for consultation and they don't come in. How do I, uh, I've had trouble like 
getting a hold of them and then trying to get them to come in. Some people, they say, hey, I'm sorry, can we rebook for next Friday? And other people, I send them like five, six text messages and they never reply. Yeah. Uh, have you ever sent them like photos of the difference of the car? Uh, actually, that's something I started doing uh, as of like a week ago where I show them a video from one of the shops of them like doing the process and before and after and also of the benefits. And that's really been helping when I'm talking to them. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I would probably, I think a video is a lot, especially if someone's not answering you. Um, so I would do a photo. I would do like, I'm sure you've seen them like the before and after photos of like a paint correction side by side. Or like when someone yes. paint corrects like a square in their car and you can see that the difference of that mm -hmm. square versus the other one. Um, I would probably send something like that and be like, hey, um, you know, I'm, I, I, what I like to do is I like to like take away something from them in my last text message. Like, um, mm -hmm. like sending them that photo being like, Hey, uh, this is, you know, just, a. I I don't really plan on reaching out anymore. It seems like you've gotten busy. Um, but just want to let you know, you know, the, uh, $200 discount or whatever it is that you want to take away from them, uh, is expiring, you know, tomorrow. Uh, we just need to have all the bookings done by then or whatever the case is and give them a visual of what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and walk away. So like you're not going to get everyone to respond to you. It's never going to happen in sales. Uh, but if I can get people to feel like I'm taking away something by them by telling them, hey, listen, I'm not going to bother you anymore. But this other thing expires. Uh, it at least gives you a better shot of them responding, feeling like if they don't respond, you've taken away something that they thought they wanted. The reason people delay and don't respond is because they think it's always going to be there. You get what I'm saying? When something's always going to be there, like okay. think about a car wash location, right? It's like, whatever, I'll just mm -hmm. get my car paint corrected next week and then next week and then next week. It's like, it's always going to be there. But if it, I'll give you an example. Shroom Junkie is a client that we worked with. Uh, we mm -hmm. did well for them, but the main company that was selling to that, that was funding them, uh, mm -hmm. had their own internal errors and they had to pull funding on this project. Okay. Shroom Junkie, but the owner announced to me that they're going to have to discontinue the product, blah, 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 blah. I love Shroom Junkie. What do you think I did that day? You got bought to win a about some. I bought a fucked on my entire garage of Shroom Junkie. Yeah. And I didn't realize they all fucking expire in like two weeks at this point. <laughs> so, 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 but like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like I had, I had 30 in the four media office already, but just the fact that I knew that they were never going to be there again without anyone pressuring me, without giving me a sale, I went on the fucking website and just went ham. I cleared stock. You know what I mean? Like I, I came home and there's like shroom junkie all the way up to the door. Um, but it, but it's because it, it was gone. If I knew shroom junkie was going to be there tomorrow, I would never have made that order. And I, to this yep. day, three months later, still wouldn't have made that order. But because it was, because I knew it was going to be taken away, I made the fucking order and it's the same for all these car places there in their head, whatever, dude, uh, I'll fix, I'll change my rim color tomorrow. I'll get a paint correction next week. It's like, it's always there. It's my fucking car wash has been there for 30 years straight. It's in the same fucking spot. It's not going anywhere. So you need to find something to take away from them. Otherwise they're just going to keep kicking it down the road. Okay. I understand now. You get what I'm saying? So you, you, I think if you think hard enough, you can find a few things that you can take away from them in that last message that'll get them to respond but as long as that car wash is there or that detailer is in that location and they are open in their head it's always going to be there and i can just kick the can down the road as far as i want yeah give them something to miss out on like Tyson yeah because there's no urgency no one's driving is like fuck oh, i hate the pain on my car like you don't even see it you know what i mean you're you always use the windshield on the road so uh there's no urgency there unless you take something away from them yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. Yeah. Good question. What up, Chris? Right, so, so to piggyback on the whole urgency thing, right? Like, let's say I get on the end of the call and then the guy's like, all right, man, like this sounds really good. I like it. Like he sounds bought in. And what he's telling me is that he likes the process, but then he's like either, you know, I need to sort th some things out on my end or move some money around or, you know, yeah, man, let me just like have a night to think it over. Let me, so, so there's a little bit of a delay. So I want to, of course, obviously close the deal right on the spot. I don't want I want to like hang in there on the call. Don't let them go easily. But at the same time, I don't want to seem needy or desperate. Right. Because I feel like people can sense and smell that energy from a salesman. So mm -hmm. how do I navigate that? 
Yeah, so uh, don't you guys have an exclusivity um, clause? We do. Which is what? Which is, so with the 20-mile radius, if someone else were to come in, and we, so we can't take on two clients within 20-mile radius or 100,000 population. 20 miles is a long ways. It's, a, it's, it's a big exclusivity. So, Chris, uh, how did you hear about us? Um, I saw one of your ads. Perfect. Um, on how many... How many other people in the city of Orlando do you think saw that ad? Probably a lot of other people. Yeah, we're targeting the city of Orlando right now because we don't have shops there. So between now and and uh, let's say it's Wednesday, between now and Friday, I got seven appointments for shops in Orlando. Uh, out of respect, I can't say who they are. You're the first one on my list. You can take your time to think about it. No problem. I have no issues with that. Take your time. I totally understand. Talk to your partners, whatever. My next call is in four hours for the city of Orlando. And if I get on that call and that person decides to make a decision, I can no longer take you and I will be canceling the rest of my calls in Orlando because of our exclusivity clause. That is something I cannot help. If he comes before you and he makes a payment and signs, I can't go back and out of respect, cancel his because I talked to you first because he made the decision first. So that is the only thing out of my hands. I'm not going to sit here and tell you some fake offer is going to expire right now if you don't sign up. I'm not going to make up all the stuff. But the the fact is, the reason you saw that ad is because our team is targeting Orlando. There are seven other shops right now that are talking to us from Orlando. Uh, they just haven't had their turn yet. You just happen to be the first one. And I cannot control if they want to sign up. I'm not going to get on those calls and try to not sign them up because I know you're thinking about it. You know what I mean? I have to respect the first person that takes action. So that is a scarcity here. It's up to you to take your time, whatever it is. Um, you know, maybe worst case you change your mind later, but right now it's first come first serve. And I can do absolutely nothing about that. It's our rule. I've seen our own team refund people right away when they see other people sign up in the same city that we're already in. Even if I signed you up, they'd send you the money back in 24 hours and we wouldn't have an agreement together. So that is the only thing I can't stop, Chris. Uh, it's up to you. If you want your competitors using the system instead of you, but one person in the city of Orlando will be using this by the end of the week. It's that's the only thing that I that I have no control of. You know what I mean? Got it. And that I I I dude, I would close every deal with that close. Because it's so it's so it's here's the thing with FOMO and scarcity. If it's real, they feel it. And that is fucking real. That is a exclusivity policy. They will refund your money. It is not in my control. It's management and ops. I'm just this fucking sales guy. One person I bring in from Orlando, if I bring in a second person, they're refunding them, dude. It's just how it is. And it's our, it's, I've already pitched you the exclusivity. You can't tell me I made it up. It's in my presentation. It's literally the rules we live by. That yeah. is real scarcity. If I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you $200 off and that's only on this call. I used to do that. Like, oh, whatever. Because in their head, they're like, whatever. You just figure I'll talk to you enough and you'll give me the 200 bucks anyways. But if it's like exclusivity out of your control, this is what I always just do. Like a lifetime, people would ask for discounts. And like, <clears throat> I would never give myself control of a discount. I'd be like, dude, I can't do anything. Like, it's not me. It's management. Like, even when I own the, in auto, right? I own the company I was doing sales. I'm like, dude, it's not my rule. The manager will just do it. He'll just override it himself. Like, I can't do anything about it. So the less control you give yourself and the more control you give to other people, other shops signing up, things like that, the higher risk it creates for them and the more FOMO it creates. Because it's not something that I could talk to Chris enough. We have rapport now and get him to change his mind. It's if they do this right. in four hours, I'm fucked. You know what I mean? There's no other, there's no other option between. So whenever I give scarcity and FOMO, I, I make it real. For example, you know, I just got off a call with an info guy. He's, he's going to be signing and paying. He just messaged me. I said, listen, dude, your start date right now, is September 18th. I have a sales team. Curtis is on fire. Curtis goes and closes two more info guys. We're talking mid October. I can't do anything about that. It's not in my control. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I have 10 other conversations. I'm closing the next couple of days, but I'm just going to be real with you and tell you I have a sales team. Their job is to to eat and close people if they're qualified. And if they close one, two right now, we're pushed out another month. So that's the only scarcity you have. Cool. Got off the call. Sends me a message. Send me the contract and ACH. I'm ready. That's FOMO. That's FOMO. That's real. It's 100% real. And I have no control over it. Neither does he. When you don't have control, it forces you to take action. When I, I, I bought a... I bought a $45,000 watch in Lebanon, okay? Uh, in America, but from Lebanon. I really struggled with this decision, okay? I'm, I'm sitting there with my friends. It's uh, it's our reunion. We haven't seen each other in two, three years. It's like, 
12 at night, one in the morning, and I'm sitting on my phone texting this watch dealer back and forth because I'm so anxious about this watch. I couldn't go to sleep or even go back to my conversation because I knew that other people were trying to buy this watch from him at the same time I did. And I knew all it took was a minute of me being like, I'll sleep on it and someone else texting him, I'll buy the watch for me to lose this watch. Okay. And it was a very rare watch that I really like. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you it, Joe. Um, so, uh, basically I say this to say the FOMO didn't come from him saying a certain price. The FOMO didn't come from any of those things. It came from the fact that I knew that I could lose to someone else that I had no contact with, no control of nothing. It was out of my hands. And because it was out of my hands, I pulled the trigger and I bought, the, I bought the watch, even though on any other day, any other watch I'm dude, I'm in a, I'm in a hundred watch groups. I see 150 watches every single day. Um, and I, I jumped on it and it like, I relieved so much anxiety off me because I had such a fear of losing because of someone else. Which one of these watches do you think I bought? Just knowing what I drive. Bottom one. Blue one. The blue one. Yeah. yeah it's this one. Is that so, not yeah. a Muppy gate? <laughs> yeah, it's an AP. Um, so, uh, so basically, um, yeah, so this is the watch. I was like so anxious and then I bought it and then he sends me a screenshot. He's like, I don't want to send you this, but since, uh, since, uh, you, you already bought it, he sends me a screenshot of his phone text and there's 20 unread messages. How much for the blue watch? All of them. Like that's FOMO. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, not, it's not in my hands. And because it's not in my hands, I have no choice but to either pull the trigger or lose. You know what I mean? And like, so be it. It's like a blind bid, right? It's like, whatever. If I, if I was wrong and no one else bid tough luck, I still got the watch, you know? So it's the same concept in, in you guys' sales. If you can remove the pressure from you or whatever it is and put it on other people signing up and creating some sort of pressure because of it, exclusivity in your case, and maybe other people's case, wait lists, um, things like that, that creates a lot of FOMO that you, you like can, you can use anytime you want because like no one has control over it, which is the scariest kind. Makes sense. Great question. Uh, what's up, Ty? <laughs> Ty, before you go, Eddie, Eddie, how are you on time? Um, shit, I'm over. Uh, four more minutes and then I gotta go because I gotta. I still gotta pack my bags. I know you do. Okay, quick. I'll be quick. So this is just something that I'm kind of juggling with. It's a little bit of. It's it's on the pace side as well. Um, as far as real estate goes, I do have experience in real estate. I've done a bit of real estate in my life, but my question comes where I really want to build credibility. I, I like to build credibility in myself, one, and obviously in Pace's team for trust. Um, and it typically doesn't really happen when I've got like someone new, but if I do have someone that's pretty advanced, um, in the beginning of the call, they'll usually ask me, um, you know, what experience I have, am I a gator? Um, have I completed any deals? Um, and then also like I can see, cause, cause I've got a timestamp on the Zoom call, which says I'm in South Africa. I often just say that I'm traveling to South Africa and I'm living in Arizona or something. I, I know that's a, not like probably the best thing to do, but I also have noticed over time, sometimes people feel a little bit sketched out. Um, so I don't want to create any like mistrust, but my question is how can I still be honest, but position myself as if I still have experience? Like what, what would you recommend? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, are you a gator question is a tough one. This is probably one I need to think on Ty just to give you the best answer possible. Um, but uh, I, I know, I know what the problem is and I, I can figure out a solution. I just need to think for a day or two and come back to you and tell you, here's probably the best approach. Um, because I'd want someone to, someone, I need to involve you with their team a bit, if that makes sense, for this to feel very cohesive. Because then you can start talking about the, the coaches and this person and Kevin's doing this and, you well, know, yeah. Kelly's and, you know what I mean? I, I, I actually already speak about that. So, like, I already speak about the coaches. I've mentioned that I'm one of the coaches as well. Um, and then I tell them I have experience in doing deals because I do. It doesn't necessarily mean it's gated deals. So I just say yeah. I have experience. 
in doing deals, which isn't a lie. Um, and then I kind of just move off of it pretty quickly and then they, they get the gist of it. Um, I guess it's just, <laughs> I mean, I don't mind just like telling them straight up, I have some experience in that. I guess it's just a juggle between, you know, I would, I would maybe reposition it and, um, you know, and say like, listen, I, my job as a salesperson, that's my career. I've sold a lot of different real estate offers. Uh, I've sold a lot of different high ticket coaching offers. I've seen what other people are selling. And the reason I'm involved with the Gator program and trying to get people into the lead program is because I know what this program has on the back end. I know the fulfillment that I have as I know the success and the results that we have. Uh, and other programs aren't providing this level of, of value. And that's why I moved over and chose personally to sell this product because I've compared it to other products. I've been in real estate. I've done my own deals and I understand the value of this method in this product and how unique it is to the marketplace. And I wanted to be a part of the reason of why people were able to get in and have that kind of success. And that's why I moved into this product. And I think it's kind of an easy way to alleviate some of those questions because it's like, you're going back to like, I do have experience. I've seen what other people are doing behind the scenes. And I know that this is the best product. And that's why I came over here and chose to sell this product. Uh, I think that's like one out that you kind of have in a way because it's like, it's it's one, you have experience in the real estate coaching space. It's like, I've seen what other people are doing. Uh, and two, it takes it back to this product's incredible. It doesn't matter who I am kind of thing. Um, but let me let me think on it a bit and, and try to see what I can come up with for you. Cool. Yeah. Question. Thanks. I mean, I I, that, I I think that's great as well. You know, I think that's um, super valuable. Um, as like well. for me, I'll tell I you, like, it's transparent as well, which is good. You know? Yeah, because I remember, dude, when I was uh, buying like e-commerce programs, I would ask the salesperson, like, okay, like, if you're so successful, why are you selling us? And their answer was about like helping other people do the same and making an impact. And I felt like it was good enough for me and I bought the program. Wow. Um, so, so probably similar situation here, right? It's like, who cares if you've done it? Why are you selling it? You know what I mean? Uh, and what, and what are other people getting out of it who have been sold by you kind of thing, right? Yeah, also you can leverage Pace and be like, yo, I have the opportunity to work with Pace and this is the position that he wanted me to put in. That team is amazing. Like, you know, Pace, and you can lean into that credibility too. Like you get to work with that team specifically and you know, oh, no Gator in and out, but you're like part of the team now. Yeah, I usually I usually say that I've been working um, you know, and, and helping, working alongside Gators and helping them and, and watching their journeys over time. And what I've found over time is that typically you and everything that they've told me tends to, you know, see a little bit more success on this side of the table, you know. Um, that's kind of how I position it. So I just, I almost say that I almost position myself as someone who, um, you know, idealizes motivation and instills motivation and then gives you the right vehicle to, to facilitate your goals. That's kind of how I position it. 100%. No, it's a great question because we are like, Eddie, we have sales team standards and like the immediate like bottom line is we are selling with the integrity. We're not fudging our numbers. We're not misrepresenting them or the company or us or whatever. Like for us, that is absolutely hard line. And so, but, but it, they're in sales, like especially with Ty's questions, there are some like gray area things where you kind of have to figure it out. And so Ty, I really do appreciate those type of questions with Eddie here because that's super important to me. Yeah, and I mean, I think especially like with Anas or Joe, you know, or anyone like even Claudia, who's like not in the States that has a typical accent um, or, or something you can hear that they're not, you know, um, in America or whatever the case is, or they're not American. Um, those, those, that curiosity comes up, right? And people want to know. And sometimes I think that you can, there's totally, like, totally, I can feel the people straight away who I can say, yeah, no, you know, I'm in South Africa, I live in Cape Town, whatever the case is. But then there are some people who have some sort of skepticism and they dig into it. And you've got to be very clever in how you respond to them so that you don't seem like, so that they don't, so that you don't lose trust so early in the call. 
I, I I get that, but and I want to guys. I want to let Eddie go. So if we want to hang around, Ty, I'm totally down to to mix with you a little bit. But guys, give Eddie a big uh, big thank you here. This was huge. Eddie's time is five thousand dollars an hour at least. So you're so thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thanks Eddie. You guys are incredible. Thank you, Eddie. Um, I'm excited to do more of these with you guys and. Um, uh i hope this was helpful i know it was more uh, storytelling but yeah if you guys keep coming with good questions next time then i'll do my best to try to guide you cool i got some homework thanks, for y'all too so cool thanks Thank guys you. stay up thanks eddie